Ah, yes, hello, sorry. Hello, hello Mark. I... So welcome everybody Good. to the last lecture of the day. It's the lecture by Mark Ivan, and he's always interested in sparse free transforms, I would say, and uh, in addition with error guarantees, a little bit of S-term error guarantees, and he will talk about such an approach, at least one such an approach. So please, the stage is yours. All right, thanks a lot, Lutz. Yeah, I'll try to keep it short. I know it's, uh, it's at least late in Moscow for whoever's there. Um, but yeah, so um, there are generalizations of this technique, but I'll be boring today and stick to the, to the Fourier basis and talk about uh, sparse Fourier transforms on rank one lattices um, uh, with exciting collaborators like Lutz himself, uh, Tony Volkmer, although I'd like to point out that the vast majority of what I discuss here will be with uh, Craig Gross, my graduate student uh, pictured here. He's very intelligent, very friendly. If you ever see him physically in a conference, when that starts happening again, feel free to say hello. Um, so just a little bit about the uh, setup of our problem here. Uh, we're going to try to approximate uh, smooth functions on the d-dimensional torus. Um, so functions periodic of d variables. Um, and so we're going to have a couple sort of actors in our discussion here. We are going to assume to begin with that uh, we, are, we have some potentially unknown set, um, let's say a hyperbolic cross whose parameters we're not quite sure of, something like that, uh, i contained in a large um, uh, integer set of vectors. So uh, vectors, uh, frequencies, uh, frequency vectors whose entries are between minus n and n. Um, so, uh, and we want to try to identify a best S term approximation from this extremely large set I. So the idea then is to work with some function F, right, this periodic function, where we assume there's a small subset uh, omega of this very large set I where there's a good uh, sparse trigonometric polynomial that on which, where you can build a good sparse trigonometric polynomial approximation to F. Um, such that you get a good approximation, let's say, with respect to the, the infinity norm. Okay, so uh, this is the type of function we're going to be working with here. And uh, keeping Excuse with the workshop. Okay. May I ask you just to clarify one question? Yes, please. In this approximation procedure, you fix the coefficients, right? These are Fourier coefficients. These are Fourier coefficients, yeah. So it's um, not like best uh, M term approximations where we allow the coefficients to depend on F, but in this case, these are fixed. So these are Fourier coefficients of function F. Ah, yeah, so we're going to be working with, with any such function. So I guess these, uh, I'm, I'm just, so this is the best approximation on this particular set of frequencies, I guess. So this is, we want there to exist. No, no, no. A in, good L2, part. in L2, it will be, but not in, in L2. L2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's true. Um, so, yep. Uh, yeah. This should be a two norm, I guess. But we're working with smooth functions on a on the d-dimensional torus. So, yeah, this should be a two norm in order to have that be true. That's true. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. My my uh, my my slide preparation was possibly a little bit faster than it should have been. Okay. Excellent question. Any other questions here? Uh, so what do we mean by smooth? Uh, so we're, our class of functions are going to have Fourier coefficients of summable, um, uh, uh, Fourier series coefficients that are summable um, in magnitude. And we, again, are going to uh, assume that this I is maybe quite a bit smaller than this minus n to n sort of massive space, but maybe not too much smaller. In fact, it could be the entire space if you want it to be. Uh, though you'll pay the price for that, of course. There's no free lunch. Um, uh, it's potentially unknown. What we're going to basically assume is that we have a cardinality bound on I. Um, and so uh, what else What else sort of to think about here? Uh, we're thinking about the situation, or sort of what I'm interested in is uh, the case where D is quite large. Think about having a numerical technique that you can actually run on the computer when D is 1,000 and maybe N is 100. 
right? So N is not too large. D is sort of astronomically large from the perspective of actually trying to do um, work with the full basis, possibly larger than any computer could ever handle, right? So in these sort of situations, what we basically have is a compressive sensing type problem. Um, uh, at least when you make the two norm here, as I should have done. And this is going to be, the point is, this is going to be completely computationally infeasible uh, to consider each basis element even once or even a small fraction of the basis elements for a fixed fraction, right? So you have to try to come up with some numerical schemes if you're going to do this approximation that run in a time and use memory that's, that's uh, much smaller than the overall basis size that you would have to consider. So that's what we're interested in here. Okay, so the approach we're going to take <clears throat> to try to do this is the following one. Effectively, we're going to marry um, uh, sparse Fourier transform techniques for functions of one variable with um, rank one lattice uh, approximation techniques and then work out, you know, prove that everything works. So that's the general idea. So the outline of the, of the approach here is going to be the following. So we have our function f that has this good uh, best s term approximation, smooth function. We are going to form a one-dimensional proxy function f tilde, just on the unit circle, um, into the complex numbers. And we're going to use rank one lattice techniques for doing this. So what this effectively means is we're going to take this, this set i, where our best s term approximation lives, and map it into a set of integers around zero from minus m to m, where m isn't too big. And uh, let's say it's gonna scale quadratically up to some additional constants in the cardinality of i, whatever that might be, okay? So, and this is gonna be an injective map, so it'll take each one of our uh, interesting Fourier, potentially interesting Fourier coefficients constrained to i to a unique location inside of this set. Right, and I'll call this frequency mapping G. Um, it's going to look like an inner product. We'll see that a little bit later. So once I have this one-dimensional function, I'm going to run a one-dimensional sparse Fourier transform method, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, on this function and learn its, its uh, best S term approximation in the Fourier basis um, using a small number of samples, a uh, number of samples that scales linearly in S in this setting the sparsity parameter and uh, polylogarithmically poly in M, which again is going to be effectively the cardinality of, of I, um, polynomial in the cardinality of I, right? So the output of this procedure as a map is just going to be a set of frequency um, coefficient pairs for the one dimensional function, right? For all of the frequencies, at least, uh, if we're thinking about the exactly sparse case, though it extends to the compressible case, effectively, for all the frequencies that are in our map G applied to the best uh, S term set omega. So, okay, a little bit of abusive notation here. This I'm assuming is the actual best uh, S frequencies that one should use for my. So, uh, so that's what I mean here. And then the then in order to recover the approximation to the original function, you need to somehow invert this, um, this map G and figure out what uh, K map to GK, and then use the fact that the Fourier coefficients of, of F here should be approximately preserved for all of the K and omega. And so you get a Fourier coefficient estimate associated with that frequency, and that's how you're gonna build your sparse trigonometric polynomial. So this is basically what we're doing here, and we're just being very careful and sort of proving that all of these steps work. Um, the main computational challenge here that you sort of need to uh, keep an eye on is um, doing this inversion. It seems potentially simple, especially if you know about rank one lattices, but I want to point out that our memory constraints are quite severe, um, and our runtime constraints are quite severe. We are only allowed to use uh, a total footprint of size uh, in this setting where especially, so there are two challenges. We're only allowed to use D times S times log sort of uh, factors of uh, polynomial factors and log of I time and memory. So that's one constraint. And the other constraint is we don't necessarily know what I is, uh, right? So 
in that case, it might be more or less impossible to invert this, even remember what this function G does or to invert this function. So we have to sort of come up with strategies to do this efficiently. Okay, so one of the pieces of the puzzle are these sparse Fourier transform theoretically, and they work well in practice as well. So what these effectively are, these are functions A, algorithms A, if you like, that take M samples uh, from the function, uh, and they put out frequency coefficient pairs. We generally build polynomials of, psi of uh, with 2S terms. So the polynomial that this uh, function outputs given these samples of F, and this is in the one-dimensional setting, so I'm assuming that F is a one-dimensional function here, um, uh, is going to produce a sparse trigonometric polynomial that satisfies this uh, beautiful looking upper bound. We can talk about it a little bit more in a second. And we allow arbitrary contamination to our function evaluations. You might not be able to directly sample the function. Perhaps you have to approximate the function evaluations or they're contaminated with noise, so we allow that. Um, the main point is uh, the if you want to do this deterministically and always succeed um, uh, in producing this approximation uh, on a piece of S that satisfies this guarantee, you can do it with a quadratic number of measurements in the sparsity times log factors in N, which is sort of the total one dimensional basis size in the setting. Um, and uh, the sort of error guarantees you get are what you want from compressive sensing methods, more or less. Right, so this are, these are the Fourier coefficients of f constrained to minus n to n. Remember, this is a one-dimensional function. Um, so you get best s term approximation errors in those lowest, Fourier, lowest frequency Fourier coefficients um, in two norm and one norm, weighted appropriately with the square root of s, as you would like. And then you have some additional sort of noise terms that come from um, the one norm of the function Fourier coefficients off of the, the lowest uh, frequencies and the infinity norm of this noise that you could have added onto each term, right? So if you have an exactly sparse function, uh, trigonometric polynomial supported in minus n to n, its frequencies in minus n to n, so of degree n, uh, you will recover it exactly and you get some graceful degradation and error thereafter. So this is an entirely deterministic method, no probability of failure. So you have this suboptimal type of quadratic and sparsity dependence. You can fix that um, by effectively subsampling the deterministic set of sampling points that are provided by the last theorem and then get a runtime and, uh, and total sampling budget and memory footprint for that matter, which is linear and S times log factors. And you, you get with high probability where you can pay a logarithmic price to make the probability of failure as small as you want. Um, the, the same error guarantee with high probability. Okay, so these are the sparse Fourier transform techniques uh, that are sort of available. Um, they're probably a little bit too complicated to cover in half an hour, so I'll just refer you to the uh, to this to these papers if you want to see how they work. I haven't thought about them before. So that was for functions of one variable. We have functions of a thousand variables. What should we do? Uh, well, maybe the easiest thing you can do um, that works quite nicely is to uh, take your function of d variables f and make a proxy function of one variable by doing effectively what I've shown in the, in the picture here. So we're going to create uh, some path and wind it around the higher dimensional torus so that it comes back and meets itself. And then the function evaluated on this path will give you a function, a periodic function in one variable where, you know, the variable is how far you've walked along the path that winds around the higher dimensional torus. It's effectively the idea. And then if you choose this, uh, this, this um, vector z with integer entries appropriately um, and consider the one dimensional function walking along the path sort of in the direction of z, you can show that uh, if you're exactly contained on some set i, your Fourier, co your Fourier coefficients are non-zero only on the set script i, that you preserve the, um, the Fourier coefficients 
uh, nicely. So exactly using this sort of calculation right here. Um, if you uh, choose Z to, for example, if you don't know what I is, just have uh, entries that are of in uniformly at random chosen from one to two M plus one, where M is sort of quadratically sized in, in I, and you get it with high probability uh, rank one lattice. If you know what I is, if you actually know what I is, you can deterministically construct a, a, a similarly sized vector Z that will work. So there are a variety of techniques from this literature that are all very nice that Lutz knows a lot about and has done a lot of work in. If you just look at Lutz's webpage, you'll see a lot about how to do these things very well. Okay, so it's my shout out for Lutz. So, um, all right, so that's effectively what we're doing here, right? So we're gonna form this, wind this path around the d-dimensional torus, create a rank one proxy function and use sparse Fourier transforms on those proxy functions. Um, we now have the problem uh, that those, those proxy functions here uh, created this map for the, that map, the, the interesting uh, frequencies that have non-trivial Fourier coefficients on them to the inner product of each such frequency with G mod, whatever this, uh, this value of M um, gives you. Right, so this is a sort of uh, non on finite sets, right? So if you just remember what it is, you can very quickly invert it, but we don't have the space to remember what it is. And if we don't know what I is, for example, we may have just randomly generated Z. And so we can't benefit from sort of knowledge of what this set I even is in this process. Okay, so how can we invert this uh, this function G quickly um, in this sort of setting. So what we're going to do, one thing we can do, we propose um, uh, with, with my graduate student, Craig, several different strategies for, a couple different strategies for uh, doing this that are more or less um, noise robust or have more or less better error guarantees uh, given with more or less better uh, computational guarantees. The simplest one to sort of show you how this can work though is just to use a sort of phase encoding approach with shift operators in one variable. So it's going to be based on the following idea. Um, if you let SJ be a shift operator in a jth variable, uh, which just shifts um, the jth variable by a small amount, let's say one over two to the n plus one, something like this, where remember n is the minus n to n to the d was the sort of larger cube in which all of the the important frequencies were housed by assumption. Um, these shift operators don't uh, change the support in Fourier of the function, but they are going to, um, uh, if you take the Fourier transform of the shifted function, encode the jth entry of K as a phase shift onto the Fourier coefficient of the original function, right? So if you have both of these uh, Fourier coefficients, you can simply divide, look at the argument, um, appropriately uh, um, uh, multiplied by, fa by factors and corrected and figure out what K sub J is. That's a basic idea. And so um, two things that sort of end up working out here for rank one lattice is going to work for the original function F, whatever it is, then it's also going to work for this sort of trivial shift of F because um, it doesn't change the support in Fourier of the, of the function, the shift operator. And uh, so you can apply um, the same sort of rank one lattice techniques to all of these shifted versions of F, apply then a one-dimensional sparse Fourier transform to all those functions to learn these uh, phase multiples of the Fourier coefficients for all of these shifts. And then once you have this information, um, you just need to know that the G of K didn't change. So if you, you know, have the same G of K here, then you know that you're getting KJ for whatever map there. And so if you get this information in the final bullet point, uh, G of K, F K, G of K phase shift versions of K for all values of J and for all K in your, in your true support set. So again, a little abuse here, I should have, but this is supposed to be the best uh, S term approximation set inside of I, you can recover what the original K was in the 4A coefficients. Right? And so 
you end up doing D plus one sparse Fourier transforms on different rank one lattice versions of the, of the shifted function. And using that particular phase shift based approach, you can prove theorems like this. Uh, so you can generate a sparse trigonometric um, multivariate polynomial that satisfies this error guarantee. Again, looks a bit like a compressive sensing guarantee. Um, you have the 4A coefficients of F restricted to I, whatever it is. Um, you get an optimal uh, best S term approximation uh, uh, error on that, in, on that best subspace I. Um, weighted appropriately. And then you have terms that have to do with the number of 4A coefficients that are outside of I and any additive noise that could have been added to the function evaluations. You can get this with high probability. And uh, so you have a runtime that's D times S times log factors. Okay, so here, um, uh, you only need to know the cardinality of, of I in order to do this um, up to this probability. Uh, this probability bound won't hold if you uh, if you don't know exactly what I is, you'll have a multiplicative delta here as well, I guess. So you'll have worse behavior and probability. So this is, if you know, if you, uh, if you know what I is, this is what you can get, I should point out. But even if you don't know I, you can still get an error bound um, with, you know, 90% certainty, you can achieve this error bound. Um, everything works. If you do know I, then, and you want a completely deterministic guarantee, so no probability of failure in the other extreme. Uh, you can just have quadratic scaling on S and uh, you still have linear dependence in D, which is something we are shooting for, times log factors. So it works well in high dimensions. And uh, this phase encoding approach I thought would be the easiest for you to understand you know, in the afternoon. Uh, so I just mentioned it, but there are other slightly more complicated techniques that can effectively take this N that's appearing here and move it into the runtime complexity. Um, so it gives you better accuracy without the N uh, for at the price of a bit more sampling. That's what it boils down to. So um, several results of this kind. Um, the other thing to mention here, right, in the regime where n is maybe 100 and d is 1,000, uh, maybe you don't care so much about n here. If you're going to use a fairly large s, it might wash out and not, be, not bother you too much. OK, so uh, those are the theoretical guarantees. So once you have this type of approximation um, method, right, for learning functions on um, with respect to the Fourier basis and many variables. The next thing you can do, which I guess is what uh, Albert was doing at the end of his talk, is consider solving, for example, differential equations using this technique. Your sampling points give you a grid that you can use to numerically solve a PDE. And so uh, Craig has been working with um, uh, trying to prove good approximation results for uh, some simple model differential equations, like this heat equation, for example. So we have some methods that work numerically for this setup now, uh, thanks to Craig's good work um, and some beginning theoretical guarantees as well. So we have a forcing function F. We're working in d-dimensional space still. We have our uh, diffusion uh, coefficient A. If you take the Fourier transform of both sides of this equation, right, you have a linear system effectively you need to solve in order to learn what the Fourier transform of your solution U is. Um, so inverting this linear operator is the entire game in this case. And uh, so you might expect that if A has some sparsity in the Fourier domain so that you can use these fast methods to learn what it is, um, and F has some sparsity as well, you might be able to reduce this linear system and invert it more efficiently. And that turns out to be the case. Uh, so that's exactly what we do. You can um, approximate A by a good trigonometric, sparse trigonometric polynomial, F by a good sparse trigonometric polynomial. And if you make some mild assumptions um, about A, you can uh, sort of prove that the, the support that you need to consider for U, um, uh, if A is dominated by a constant term, so it's bounded below by a sufficiently large number, uh, is gonna be close to the support of F with some modifications um, that come from the, the Fourier support of A. 
So you can sort of reduce this linear system significantly uh, with, with respect to what you need to look at and then invert a smaller system. And so if you do that, um, you can get numerical wet methods that seem to work pretty well. So here are a couple numerical procedures to sort of round off the talk with some, some pictures that show that I know how to make animations work in my PDFs. It's very exciting. Uh, so we have, uh, we have our diffusion coefficient to two frequencies effectively. Uh, we have our forcing function f with three, three frequencies. All right, you notice they're sparse in Fourier, uh, relatively high frequencies involved compared to the sparsity level any, at any rate. Um, a standard spectral method for solving this one dimensional equation requires you to increase n to be about 400 before you hit the um, something approximating uh, uh, numerical precision. So you have a lot of aliasing in the beginning. This is sort of showing you what happens as you increase n uh, by factors of two. And you, have actually, you eventually get convergence to the true solution, which is in blue here, um, as you increase n to about 400. On the sparse spectral method side, you can just use a sparsity of three for your um, sparse Fourier transforms that we discussed in the previous slides. Learn their support, fill out this uh, sparse or linear system that you can invert, and you get the solution once sparsity is equal to three, and it works. You get the same solution as you do for the full uh, spectral method. So you can achieve in this sort of sparse multi-scale PDE setting a sparse and Fourier, I should say, setting, you, you get numerical savings in the one dimensional case. And you can then begin to make it more interesting by considering what we really want to do, which is the uh, thousand dimensional case, right? So um, just because we can still see pictures of this and it's much easier to verify that you're actually getting the right answer. Um, let's just look in the two dimensional setting. Um, so two frequencies in A again, uh, three sparse forcing function F. Um, we have a standard spectral method here. And as you increase N in each, uh, each dimension, X, Y dimension to be about 400 again, or a little bit less, you get something approximating uh, numerical round off errors or you know, good errors on the order of 10 to the minus 11 or something like that. Right, so this is what the solution looks like. And same deal over here, once your sparsity gets to three um, and you've, uh, you have resolved again the sparse system you need to compute, you can get similar accuracies from a sparse spectral method because of the sparse structure of, the, of F and A. Um, okay, so you get uh, a savings of being about N squared in this setting to being uh, something linear in S. Um, and again, in higher dimensions, we expect this, the same behavior will hold up and you will be able to potentially, you know, at least if there's a good sparse approximation in Fourier, be able to solve significantly or very high dimensional uh, PDE of this type and, and get things to work. Okay, so a whirlwind introduction to um, how to use these sparse Fourier transform techniques in high dimensional settings. If you're interested in the Fourier basis. Here are some uh, references if you're interested in seeing where the theorems came from and what's actually involved in proving them uh, from the slide pre from the slides uh, five, six, and nine. And um, I should also mention there's some nice work with Tony Volkmer uh, in particular um, where we generalize the sparse Fourier transform techniques for the Fourier basis to more general types of bounded orthonormal systems. Uh, and so you should, you can in principle do similar things for uh, at least restricted types of, of orthogonal polynomials like Chebyshev polynomials and get things to work as well. But uh, we haven't, uh, we haven't figured out how to get the same type of linear and sparsity type efficiency in those settings. It's a much more difficult problem. Anyways, I'll, uh, I'll stop rambling at this point and see if anyone has any questions. Well, thank you, Mark, uh, for this very nice talk and this very impressive numerical examples. So are there any questions? No? 
And then I have a question on this, on this uh, examples of this uh, PDE. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, can you do this with more general A? So with a, with a, with a function or is it somehow important that you have an, at least a nice, uh, a nice uh, free series of this A? Uh, and a nice so, free support there. The uh, so I so this is uh, this is a preliminary work. Let's say we've only numerically tested uh, exactly for a sparse A. Uh, there's no reason why it won't work with A that have a good sparse approximation um, up to not being able to achieve the full sort of you know the same type of error levels that you get from. Uh, from a spectral method, which is what we are doing as a baseline, you know, this should really work as accurately as a standard technique in this type of setting. So let me say, um, neither theoretically nor numerically can we demonstrate at the moment that you can have a completely general A uh, or not, com you know, more compressible A that isn't exactly sparsely supported in Fourier, but I see no reason why it's going to fail as long as it, as long as uh, there is a sufficiently accurate sparse approximation. Um, I believe you'll get errors that are going to be bounded in some sense by uh, whatever that good, whatever that sparse approximation level is. So, so do you mean a sufficiently sparse approximation for A or for, for U? So if you assume just... If, so the, just... The, the, uh, the support of U is, uh, is, effect, is going to be dictated by, not entirely, but at least approximately dictated by the whatever support sets work for A and F. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least, it... at least if A is, uh, at least if A is, um, is lower bounded well enough, right? So you, you have to have some uh, type of decay. And the sort of, the idea is there that uh, if A were constant, right, then the support of F would determine everything about you. Um, and so if, if A isn't, uh, isn't just a constant, it actually has something interesting going on, then you can doctor the support, the sparse support of F with the sparse support of A and come up with at least numerically and, and um, uh, up to some symbol pushing uh, theoretically as well, it looks like a, a guaranteed good set approximation set for the solution U based on whatever these support sets are. Yeah, so um, the, the, the crucial assumption is that you have uh, a nice sparse approximation of A and of F and then uh, yeah, nice, this. nice enough, and that A has, yeah. um, I believe, A is going to have to be yeah. sort of dominated by uh, by a constant term that forces you to look, let's say, at least partially like you're solving a constant, um, yeah. a constant diffusion type equation. Okay, thanks. So something like this, right? Only half yeah, of yeah. the energy is sort of, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or, Are there any other questions? So this seems not the case. So yeah, thank you, Mark, for this nice yep. talk. And uh, we thank the, I, I should say that we thank the, all the speakers of today, right? Yeah. And, thank you very much. and also the audience for the patience and how to Yeah, but so yeah, for today we are done. So that means we'll see all of you tomorrow. Thank Great. You. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. And uh, Thanks, Mark, for your nice talk.